Okay, Harold James, I wanted to ask you about how banking, how the future of um, what the future of banking history looks like. If we take institutions like the ECB, for example, which have become highly politically toxic, you know, the headquarters were uh, the subjects, the target of, of very strong protests last year. Um, has banking acquired a new sort of contentiousness in popular history or popular memory? And if so, what does the future of banking history look like? Well, I, I think uh, central banks on both sides of the Atlantic have uh, indeed become the centres of political controversy. And so people ask naturally uh, what the uh, best relationship uh, between the central bank and the representative institutions, parliaments, Congress uh, sh sh should be. Um, and uh, you know, I think the central bank discussion is really one that's a bit different to the the, the, the discussion of banks. Um, I mean, banks are obviously also the subject of tremendous political controversy, and um, you know, there's obviously also been a fantastic amount of misbehaviour in the in the banking system. Um, and people are always going to have a discussion about how much of that misbehavior is due to inadequate or poor regulation and how much of it is due to criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think actually both sides of that need to be managed uh, in the sense that um, the, uh, the, the institutional framework needs to be correct, but also the, uh, the Judicial prosecution of criminal offences needs to be needs to to, to to be handled correctly. Mm -hmm. And as a historian yourself, um, what are some of the challenges you encounter, uh, given that so many banking operations are conducted in secrecy? And I'm thinking particularly of the ECB here. What challenges are there in writing history? Um, the, the the more you go on, I think uh, over time, the more this discussion of openness and transparency becomes important. So uh, it's not a coincidence that the ECB moved to this new building, which is all about glass and openness and transparency. But obviously the ECB is not very transparent yet about its its minutes um, in the way that the Federal Reserve over the last 20 years made the move to the publication of um, minutes very, very quickly and then transcripts with a five-year delay. Um, I think at some point the ECB will move to that um, and it will obviously change the kind of discussion that takes place. But I think it, uh, there is a case to be made on the basis of the Federal Reserve history that moving to this kind of openness actually improves rather than diminishes the quality of discussion. And this morning you were talking about some of the major changes taking, um, or you referred in your comments about huge changes taking place in the banking industry over the last few decades. Can you specifically talk about what these changes are and how that has affected the history of banking? Um, we, we, we had an interesting discussion about that this morning, I think, uh, that uh, what you're really moving to is a, is a world in which there are just incredible numbers of transactions that are taking place all the time, and they're made in a quite decentralized way. Um, and so the the old-fashioned school of thinking, you can just tell the history of something just by taking the papers of the big person, usually a man at the top, um, and, and working out uh, what he was thinking and doing, uh, that doesn't work at all anymore. And so uh, you know, there's, there's really a need to move to more quantitative-based uh, story analysis in order to take place, uh, to take account just of this com complexity of the way in which business is being done. And just finally, in the panel just now, uh, there was talk of, um, you discussed uh, the possibility of deepening the monetary union. Um, mm. Do you think that this is a, a political impossibility? No, I don't think it's a political impossibility. I think, in fact, the the multiplicity of Europe's contemporary crises, the the, the way that we have a security crisis and a refugee crisis uh, as well. I mean, these these really demand common action. If Europe can't act in common uh, on something like the Russian threat to Ukraine or to to, to Eastern Europe or on the destabilization of the Middle East, um, then. You know, the, the essence of the European project disappears. So there's the, it's a moment of tremendous challenge, uh, but 
I think what, what this challenge is going to produce is in the end a more intensified version of cooperation. So just very quickly, uh, is the Eurozone crisis, crisis afflicting Europe generally political or economic? It's, it's both a political and an e economic crisis. Uh, it's, it's, it's clearly a political crisis. Um, it, it has to do with institutional dysfunctionality um, and it has to do with differences of ideas that are fundamentally political. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.